Hi guys, it's Claire. Welcome back. Today I'm bringing you the second part of my January reading wrap-up. Today I'll be talking about my three favorite books of the month, and I didn't plan out my reading in any way this month, but there ended up being a lot of kind of interesting parallels and connections between these books that I'll talk about along the way. And actually there were interesting connections between these books and A Tale for the Time Being too, which I also read this month and talked about yesterday. But I just wanted to give you a heads up about that because it's just a really wonderful thing when you're reading a bunch of books and they end up being in interesting conversation with each other. The first book I read this month and probably my favorite book of the month was A True Novel by Minae Mizumura and this is a Japanese retelling of Wuthering Heights and I've already made a full video review talking about the ways in which this book builds upon and departs from Wuthering Heights in really interesting ways. But one of the things that I didn't really get to touch on in depth in that video was how this book, which is supposed supposedly a retelling of a Western classic is in so many ways a fundamentally Japanese novel. This book is really interesting because it opens with a really lengthy prologue that's kind of startling because it follows a character named Minae Mizumura. And as you're reading this kind of autobiographical, fictionalized, perhaps not fictionalized retelling of Minae Mizumura's early life, she begins to talk about some of the different literary traditions in Japan. And one of those traditions is something called a true novel, which is very much aspiring to the ideal of the 19th century Western novel. Kind of in opposition to that is the literary tradition of the I novel in Japan, which is a confessional form of storytelling that features the author as a main character and centers around their life experiences. And so as she's explaining these literary traditions that arose in Japan, you realize that she is framing her retelling of a true 19th century Western novel with this fundamentally Japanese I novel. And I just found that so interesting and so fascinating because a lot of this book deals with Japan in the years following World War II as Westernization was becoming increasingly present in Japan. And so while she's making all these commentaries in the book and in the text about that, she also is making a sort of commentary on Westernization through the form and structure of this novel too. This novel is already such a fantastic and compelling story that has so many layers meticulously built into it, and I just loved that around all of that, Minae Mizumura is able to make you think critically about the structure of the book and the definition of a novel and how storytelling shifts and changes between nations and across languages. Anyway, I really recommend this book. I loved it, and like I said, if you want to hear more of my thoughts on it, I'll link a video to that down below. And right after reading A True Novel, I read A Tale for the Time Being by Ruth Ezeki, which ended up being the perfect follow-up because half of this book is narrated by a character named Ruth, who is an author living in British Columbia and who shares a lot of the characteristics and life details with Ruth Ozeki. So half of this book is very much an I novel. I didn't really like this book, but it was really cool to kind of discover two books one after the other talking about this literary tradition that I had never heard about before. I read A Tale for the Time Being as a buddy read with Catherine from Literary Prince, and while we were discussing that book, I was telling her how much I had loved a true novel, and she was like, oh, that's so funny because I'm reading a nonfiction book by Minae Mizumura right now called The Fall of Language in the Age of English, and I was like, oh my god, she's written a nonfiction book? Just give me a second while I order that on Amazon. This book talks about the rise of English as the universal language in the world today and the implications that a universal language has for national languages and literatures. And she's particularly focused on Japanese and Japanese literature because that's the background she's coming from. And in this book she really explores the implications of choosing to write in a language that's not English and sort of the ways in which you're maybe limiting yourself from having a global or international audience. And certainly there are commercial downsides to not writing in English, but she also is a firm believer in language being a fundamental part of your identity. And for her, she really can't 
write novels in a language other than her own. And her books are kind of notoriously difficult to translate into English because she really utilizes all the things that are so specific about the Japanese language and therefore difficult to translate. And this book is so interesting because it traces in a concise and efficient way the history of the Japanese language and its sort of unlikely development. You really get a sense of how deeply she loves and is connected to the Japanese language and how important it is to her. And this book is kind of heartbreaking because she really makes you contemplate all the things that we lose as local and national languages become less prominent and as writers from non-English speaking countries choose more and more to write in English. But at the same time it's also a very forceful provocative sort of call to arms to writers and to Japanese writers in particular to defend their native languages, to continue to write in them, and to continue to utilize and celebrate what is unique about those languages. And this book is dense. It's a little bit academic. You get phrases like asymmetrical relationships, different temporalities. So I'm not saying this is a quick read by any means, but I think it is essential reading for anyone who loves Japanese literature and for anyone who likes to read translated literature in general. I really don't think I can ever read translated lit the same way again after having read this book because it just fundamentally shifts the way that you think about the dynamics at play in translation. It leaves you with a lot to think about in terms of what we gain but what we lose as the world becomes increasingly globalized and which languages kind of come out with an advantage and privileges simply through accidents of history. These ideas of nationality and languages and identity are also very much at play in the book Pachinko by Min Jin Lee. This novel follows several generations of a Korean family from about 1910 to 1989, and it follows them as they leave Korea and move to Japan largely because of the poverty, deprivation, and exploitation that is present in Korea during the Japanese occupation of that country. This family ends up staying in Japan permanently, and they essentially become people without a state. And they're very much treated as foreigners and second-class citizens for generations even after their children and grandchildren are born in Japan, grow up speaking Japanese, and have never even set foot in Korea. And this book actually contains a quote from a text called Imagined Communities by Benedict Anderson, and that's a book that Minae Mizumura breaks down and critiques in the fall of languages, and it was just interesting to read this book right afterwards because it does explore the questions of what is a nation, what makes you a citizen of a nation, and how how does the language that you speak play into your identity and national identity? I think you'll probably know if this book is for you within the first few chapters. I can see how people might find it a bit boring because it's written in a very clean, economical style. And despite a very densely populated cast of characters, the people in this book are very much ordinary people who are more distinguishable because of their subtler traits than because of any sort of outsized or super vivid personality. The book is told in omniscient third person, so you get the perspectives of every character in the book through a kind of constant shifting free indirect discourse. And the book does move at a quick pace and covers a lot of ground. And Min Jin Lee is able to move from 1910 to 1989 in the space of about 500 pages by sometimes jumping ahead a couple years or several years between individual chapters. And this story is really structured through parcels of time and each chapter is contained and allows you to kind of immerse yourself in the daily life of these characters. And Min Jin Lee really excels at making these sort of daily activities and interactions seem specific and important and vivid. And what I mean by that is in a particular scene, you can get a real sense of how, say, a Japanese butcher has a lot of affection and admiration for one of the Korean women in this central family. And even though he only appears in that scene and never appears again throughout the rest of the book, Book, in that moment you really get a sense of the dynamic between them and what exists between them or doesn't exist between them and what might have been different if circumstances and history had been different. And so if this book was a landscape painting of a field of grass, every single blade of grass 
in that painting would be individually drawn and distinct. That's how Min Jin Lee draws these characters and their interactions and their experiences. And it makes this book feel really dense with real human experience. And so by the end of 500 pages, you really feel like you have lived several lifetimes with these characters. I did find that this book ran out of steam a little bit with the final generation of this Korean family. And it also felt like the closer she got to sort of present day, the more she had a tendency to sort of over explain. So the ending wasn't quite as good or strong as I was hoping that it was going to be, but that didn't diminish the fact that I really loved the rest of the book and really enjoyed spending time with this family. Reading this book also meant that I started and ended the month by reading a long, chunky novel set in Japan. Pachinko also opens with the great line, history has failed us, but no matter. And I think that that is a line that applies to all three of these books. And it sort of beautifully echoes the ways in which Mizumura in both her fiction and her nonfiction illustrates the ways in which individual people's fates are very much subject to the tide and accidents of history. Those were my favorite books that I read this month and I really can't wait for the next time that what I'm reading has a sort of unexpected synergy between books. Let me know if you've read any of these books and if you have thoughts on them. As always, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time.